Okay, now that we've had some hints that there's something out there other than vector fields, but, but sort of similar to vector fields that we might want to be working with, I'm going to define uh, the start of the story of differential forms. So I'm going to define a differential one form to be a formal expression, let's say p dx plus q dy plus r dz. And now this is going to be in R3. And it's not going to be that hard. It's not, it's not going to be hard at all, in fact, to generalize this. Let me put little spaces in here. To 1, 2, 3, or uh, 4, 5, or n dimensions. But let's look at R3, which is where we're most familiar. Okay. So what does it mean, a formal expression? Well, that doesn't really mean anything until I tell you what you can do with it. Um, and so that's, But that's a fairly common thing in mathematics. So we start out with a um, something that's kind of formal and then we'll figure out to define it in terms of what we do with it. That's not the best way to do things and in fact we'll come back and sort of say maybe what the deep meaning of this differential one form is. One, one aside, um, we'll need this later. A differential zero form is really easy to define. It's just a function. okay? And in fact, so that we can do calculus with it, it's a differentiable and I mean a differentiable function uh, f from r3 to r, just a real valued function. Okay, and so for example, p, q, and r here is our usual, like our usual notation for vector fields. These are functions, so I should say that where p, q, r, oop, that's an r, r functions on r3. Okay, so what do we do with that? Well. The main thing that we're going to do with it, or the thing that I'm kind of leading up to most, there's a lot of things we can do with it, but the main thing is uh, just to find the integral. And this is the place we've seen this notation before is inside an integral. So we're going to define the line integral of a one form on an oriented curve, just like we had before for vector fields, to be, okay, well, integral of something that looks like this with certain p, q, and r is just what we were saying before. It's the integral from a to b, whatever the parameter, parameters are supposed to be, of p dx dt plus q dy dt plus r. Yeah. Shift r, not control r, in case you're wondering why that happened. Dz dt, that's an explicit function dt. Now, to be really careful, I really should, of course, say p of x of t, y of t, z of t, and explicitly for q and r as well. And that there, that is going to have a role. I'm taking a function that's defined on r3, and I'm creating out of it a function that's just defined on r, um, just on this interval, in fact. I'm composing the function p with the curve function, and similarly with q and r if I wrote it all out. Now, I don't want to belabor the notation, but that is going to be important, the idea of composing functions, and it's going to turn into what's called pulling back differential forms. Okay, so that's really just saying, yeah, this, this is exactly what we were using this as a notation for. So what's new about it? Well, there's going to be a lot new about it, but we're going to work up to it. Um, what we can do first is define a microscopic version of the above. Okay, so we've got a curve and I'm not doing this freehand, so it's hard for me to draw the curve, but we've got a curve, and tangent to that curve is, at every point is the velocity vector. And the velocity vector you can think of as kind of a, an infinitesimal version of the curve. Okay, And so what we might like to do is we're going to define a way for a one form to eat a vector at a point. Okay. So what we're going to define is, if I've got a form that looks like this, uh, let's put that in parentheses to make sure we know it's just one gadget. And then we're going to put in parentheses because it's going to now eat a vector. And I mean that this is now going to be, uh, we, we can think of it a couple ways. We can think of, of taking kind of a pairing, kind of like a dot product, and in fact it's going to look exactly like the dot product, between a one form and a vector. 
That's kind of a symmetrical way to think about it. We can also think of this as saying that the one forms, uh, one of its roles in life is a function that eats vectors, that has inputs as vectors and spits out numbers. So, um, what we're, let's just give it some input vector, let's say um, a, b, c. And what it's going to do is the dx part is going to match up with the i component, the first component here, and just spit out the a, and then that's going to multiply by p. So it's going to be p, a, plus q, b, plus r, c. Now let's see what's going on. I, want, I wanted to get this on here, but now, now I need to uh, specify it a little, bit, a little bit more. Okay, so let's say the point is uh, x naught, y naught, z naught. None of this is really a super essential to the idea, but I want to be precise. I've got a vector, and that's ABC. I guess in our book we've been using angle brackets. So maybe I should put angle brackets in there. There we go. Okay. Um, so there's a vector sitting at a point in, in R3, and I take this differential one form. It's like a vector field. These are functions. This is defined everywhere. So this is really, I'm going to take P at X naught, Y naught. Z naught, eh. and similarly, I'm going to define these guys as well. Okay, um, and that should be a C, not a Z. Aha! I wonder if you caught that. Okay, so this looks a lot like the dot product. If this were a vector field and this were a lowly just one vector, one point, this would basically be taking the dot product of this vector, the components P, Q, R, with A, B, C. So you might think again, hmm, this isn't really doing much. Well. It'll do, it'll do what we want um, eventually, but it's, it's, I admit it's a little bit of a slow start. So here's the next thing we want to do. Now that we've got this idea that a one form can eat a vector, um, I would need a picture. Okay, And so here's the picture. Let me, let me go to the vector field analyzer 2 here. Um, here's, a, here's the default vector field for the vector field analyzer 2. It's just this kind of funky, complicated, moderately complicated function. And um, the program is giving us the usual thing, which is arrows at every point, or not at every point, but at a selected grid of points. In principle, there's a, an arrow at every point. We just can't draw them all for this vector field. And I want to point out these little dots here, these little radio buttons. Um, we can go from arrows, contravar, that stands for contravariant, which means vector field, and we won't talk about why necessarily. And then if you click these, these green funky things start to appear, and the arrows go away, and over here it stacks covar, or covariant. Well, these stacks are the picture of um, a differential one form, as it turns out. And this is the differential one form. Instead of having uh, sine x plus cosine y i plus sine x times cosine y j, turns out this is the differential one form that's sine x plus cosine y dx plus sine x times cosine y dy. And let's, let me see, show you how the two things that I've said we can do with a one form already exactly correspond to, uh, to this picture. Um, what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to make a little tiny curve to basically represent a vector. A vector. So I'm going to put a vector at this point, and I'm just going to draw, doop, there we go. And that produces a number. So the green here is indicating that that's a positive number, that when I draw the arrow in the direction, you can see these little bumps, in the direction across this, these uh, stacks, in the direction of the bump, I get a positive number. If I draw it opposite, I get a negative number. And if I draw it in a place where the stack, there's not that many stacks, I don't get as big a number. Notice it's not a, as thick a green, and this, this it says circ, but it's really not a circulation. It's really an integral. Um, I get a smaller number. So what I'm doing here is I'm kind of cheating a little bit. I'm using the functionality of this thing to create, to calculate line integrals, and I'm pretending that my little tiny curve is just a vector. But that's what a vector is, really. So it's just a sort of a tiny little segment of a curve. And so what's going on here is that these stacks give a recipe. Any vector that you have in the plane, what you do is you just draw it against these stacks and you count you basically count how many stacks it pierces. Now there's a scaling factor here, um, so it's not. This isn't exactly how many stacks it pierces. It'd be great if you set it up that way, but the the picture wouldn't work very well. So here I pierce three stacks, and it's about 0.15. Let's try piercing. This looks like about six stacks. Yeah, it's about twice as much. 
Now, if I go parallel to one of these lines, I get very, very little contribution. So this is a great picture of a differential one form that instead of putting an arrow at every point, you put these little stacks. The way um, a famous book by Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler, uh, Gravitation, puts it, they like to think that this is a little mechanism that when you take the this arrow through it, every time it pierces a, a layer, there's a, a bell goes bong, and you're counting the bongs of the bell. Now that's for a, a tangent vector. Well, what now let's actually do a real curve. It's the same idea. The integral of this vector field around the curve is basically measured just by how many bongs of the bell you had as you go along the curve and you count the ones going against the dot as negative and these ones going with the dot as positive. And then there's an overall scale factor for this picture, so this doesn't come out to be exactly that number of bongs of bell, but that's the, that's the idea. So let me point out how that addresses um, one of the issues we had before with this, which was um, this, this kind of weird thing about scale factors with gradients and things like that. If I go back to this, I can't really predict what the line integral is going to be of this curve. I know it's going to be positive, and I could say it's going to be decently large, maybe, because it's got some arrows that are aligning with it, but I have no way, no way of really predicting what the number's going to be, because I don't really have a scale for what this, big, this arrow means. The stacks basically carry their own scale. Now again, there's this a sort of a constant fudge factor built into the picture, but we figured out kind of what that was. And once you've got that constant fudge factor, you can actually predict just from looking at the picture and counting how many stacks you cross, how big the line interval is going to be. That's really a deep thing about why it seems might, it might seem trivial. But it's a deep aspect of why differential forms are the right things to integrate, and vector fields are really not. Every time we've integrated a vector field on a, a curve, we've really actually secretly turned it into a differential form and then integrated the differential form, as it turns out. Now that was a complicated field. Let's look at the picture a little bit more with, with some simple fields. Okay, so here's dx. This is 1 dx plus 0 dy. So you want to think of that as just this field, of uniform field of, of stacks, and you pierce them in that way, you pierce them that way, you don't pierce them in this direction. And of course dy, 0 x dx plus 1 dy, is going to be like this. dx plus dy is going to be like this. Notice they're a little a little denser um, because you're going to get both both of the things contributing. What about 2x dx plus 0 dy? Okay, ooh, 2 times x, sorry. Okay, so this is something where it's still, if you go in the y direction, you get very essentially no contribution. If you go in the x direction, you start piercing some bongs, then more and more and more and more, and you get more of a quicker rate of bonging, if you know what I mean. Okay, and here, to get positive, I go in this direction. If I go this way, I get negative. So that's going to be 2x uh, dx. What about 2x dx plus 2y dy? Hmm, that might be familiar. Oh, hey, that sort of looks like maybe the gradient. If this were a gradient, if this were the vector field, it would be the gradient vector field of um, just r squared, x squared plus y squared. And notice not too many um, bongs of the bell as I go out here, and more and more and more and more and more. Hmm, that might have to do with the fact that the gradient gets steeper and steeper. Oh, wait a minute. It might also have to do with the fact that the level curves of x squared plus y squared have exactly this pattern. We're actually almost staring at the level curves of x squared plus y squared. That's very interesting. And that's common to a lot of the, the fields we've seen so far. This one in particular. This the components of it, if we turned it back into a vector field, it would be a gradient vector field. It would be, it would be conservative. And notice these stacks kind of line up with each other, and you can kind of connect the stacks continuously to be level curves. That's very cool. If I change it to something else, like minus y dx plus x dy, notice that these can't be put together. I've got very thin stuff here, and then thick up here. Where did these all these other stacks come from? They're kind of created as I go out. And so I couldn't actually just say, okay, here's one line and here's another line, and that makes all the lines in these little stacks. So that has to do, let me go back to here, okay. That has to do with um, a fundamental definition. This is the new version of the gradient. I promised that we would have a new version of the gradient, and it's not really a vector field. Instead of 
uh, nabla f, gradient f, being equal to the vector field, partial f, partial x, let me copy that, be quicker, partial f, partial y, partial f, partial z, okay, we replace that with, it's called df, and it's just the same partials, but instead of made into a vector field, we made it make it into a differential form. Plus dy, oops, not plus there, and then plus after that, and then this is dc. Okay, and maybe we'll put a little space in here. Okay, so that's going to be the new version of the gradient. It's a differential form. Again, you might think, I think it's just a notation switch. Well, it turns out it's the start of something really big that does start with essentially a notation switch. Let's look at how that works with uh, the picture. For example, d of x squared plus y squared, not too surprisingly, is 2x dx plus 2y dy. That's exactly this vector field we had before. 2 times x, 2 times y, where the cur where the stacks mesh up into essentially a picture of the level curves of the function. This is really cool, that basically when you draw the level curves of a function, you can just kind of chop those level curves up a little bit, and you've got the stack picture of the, the DF, the real, honest to God, better version of the gradient. You can't do that with the arrow version. This doesn't. This has a nice relationship to the level curve picture, but this basically is the level curve picture. So you might think, well, so we're just giving a new name to level curves, but remember, if I have something that isn't a conservative vector field, this guy is not conservative, well, its version of the D version of this, or the, uh, the, the stack version of this, is something where you can't join the stacks together to be just a nice um, level curve picture. And so that's just visibly obvious from this picture where it wasn't isn't as obvious from the arrow picture. That's a small part of, of why this is cool. So to finish up this video, one more thing. Let me just show you one other use of why the df is, is a good thing. Um, suppose I have f and I want to look at it of x of t, y of t, z of t. For example, maybe I'm like integrating something or I'm just looking at the ch a chain rule situation where I've got maybe a bug flying through space, f is the temperature at every point in space, and this create, gives, gives the temperature as a function of time, for example. Okay. Well, what can I, what's the most interesting question there? The most natural calculus question is, what's df dt? Okay. And we know, hey, wait a minute, it's basically this, but just divide those dx's by dt's. Just take those, and this is very familiar. This is the process of, that we had up here for turning a differential form into something we integrate. The chain rule works extremely naturally with this idea, this notation of, of the differential form. Basically because this is essentially the matrix of derivatives in disguise. It's going to be something a bit different when we get to like two forms and three forms, but one of the things that's going on here is the chain rule works very naturally. And in fact, there's a very precise technical sense of the word natural that's going on here. Um, and that's really key to why differential forms are the way to go.